Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Islesboro Community Conversation. Thanks for joining us. My name is Suzanne McDonald. I'm on staff at the Island Institute. We're going to take a couple minutes for people to get settled online um, with us and safely out of the waiting room. Um, as we're waiting, I hope folks are comfortable using the chat box. I want to invite you to respond to a quick prompt just to kind of start getting some voices and thoughts out there as part of this discussion. Um, please go into the chat box down at the bottom of your screen and enter in where are you participating from? Where are you calling in from? And what's one thing that you really cherish about Islesboro? And I would love to see what you have to say. So I think we'll get started. Um, I'm sure folks will continue to tr trickle in um, from the waiting room, but thanks to all of you who joined us so promptly and for spending a little bit of your evening with us here tonight in this virtual format. Um, my name is Suzanne McDonald. I'm the Chief Community Development Officer at the Island Institute. Um, in my role, I help to oversee all of our programmatic teams with a particular focus on our economic resilience and our climate resilience teams. I'm really excited to have this chance to connect with you all. Um, obviously in person and on an island would be much more preferable for all of us. Um, but just to continue to use the technology that's available to us to stay connected with all of you is top priority for the Island Institute during these times. Um, tonight, we are going to uh, take an opportunity to give you a little bit of an insight into where the work is at for the Island Institute, sort of how the organization has been evolving and focusing our work and effort. And also to create some space to hear from all of you, give you the chance to reflect back to us and to each other what are some of the pressing needs and concerns, challenges or opportunities that you're facing out on Islesboro? Um, granted, the virtual format makes it a little bit difficult to feel really like this is a conversation, but we are really hoping that we can hear from all of you in the chat box um, one way or the other so that we can answer some of the questions we're hearing are on your mind. So thanks to folks who submitted questions in advance, there'll be plenty of opportunity for you all to ask questions this evening as well. Finally, we're really excited to have the opportunity to introduce you to Dr. Tony Chapwin, who is uh, has joined us and has been on board since late summer. Um, Tony's going to be able to participate in the conversation, answer some of your questions, and also just fill you in a little bit about his role with the organization and, and vision for where we all head. So uh, hopefully that's what you thought you were signing up for. Um, just quick reminders on Zoom. Everybody has had exemplary behavior thus far. Um, we have uh, uh, the chance to, I'm actually having just a little bit of trouble on my end, believe it or not, um, to forward the slides. There we go. Um, quick Zoom tips. You know all how to mute yourself in the uh, bottom left-hand corner. Please do so unless you're called on by myself. Um, and you have other ways that you can adjust your view so you can see all of us. It's a little tough to do that since I'm sharing my screen, um, but that uh, using the view button in the top right-hand corner can help. And um, later on, we will uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions over the chat box, which is down in the um, bottom middle of how this works for most folks. You can put in your questions later on. You can put them in now um, at any point in time throughout the conversation. And Sue Bernier, who's here with us tonight, is um, going to be tracking all of the questions submitted. If uh, for some reason you don't want uh, the whole group to see your question, you can send a message directly to Sue. If you go to the participant list, you can find her and uh, direct message her your question. We are record recording this evening's webinar um, and we'll uh, be able to send a follow-up link to all of you so that you can check it out if uh, you miss any of it or wanna share it with, with friends or family. And we'll also be for, uh, circling back uh, in that email to share any resources we might reference during this evening's conversation. So, um, and welcome to all of you. I see there are still some more folks joining. Um, we're just gonna tee up a little bit of background on the Island Institute, and then we'll get into some discussion of some Islesboro specific issues. Um, so for those of you who I think most of you are friends and supporters, we're lucky to have you on the call. But if you're less familiar with the Island Institute, just a, a quick overview. Um, we have been around for almost 40 years. We consider ourselves a community development nonprofit organization based here in Rockland. 
And at this point, we actually have more than 50 full-time staff and more than 3,000 members. And uh, together, we are really focused on supporting the coastal communities here in Maine, as well as the remaining 15 unbridged islands to confront an increasing amount in, of change um, here in our world. I just wanna quickly say, we're really fortunate to also have the support of an 18 member board of trustees, two of whom we're lucky enough to have on the line tonight, um, Shay Conover and Chuck Barrell. Um, thank you, Shay and Chuck for everything that you do and bring to our work and making sure that we have a good island perspective when we're making decisions about um, the organization. Along with our board, our staff, our members, we also have strong connections to community members and other partner organizations. We are really working hard to address some of the toughest challenges that we see facing the coast of Maine right now. We are trying to focus that effort through an interconnected set of strategies that are in three areas um, around trying to activate and apply climate solutions, strengthening coastal economies to become more resilient and empowering strong leadership at the local level to deal with some of the tough questions and decisions that need to be made as we move through, forward to the future. Uh, climate is a particularly important uh, piece for these days. We, it's hard to turn on the news or open the newspaper or really just go about our daily lives at this point without uh, realizing the intense disruption that climate change is bringing to our coast. Um, with our strong connections to island and coastal communities, we are really focused on bringing resources to the table to help communities make decisions and make investments to become more climate resilient. That can include technical assistance, uh, including the program that is uh, operating on Islesboro right now. Shout out to the Islesboro Energy Committee and their great work on the ETIP program to envision a clean energy future for uh, the Islesboro community. It also has to do with accessing financial resources to bring to bear incentives that are out there um, and ways to get these projects built once we have plans. We are really focused on then also figuring out how do we transfer or scale what we see in one community to another. And Islesboro in so many ways has been the place where we look for some of these solutions, broadband, um, and need I say more, where we can point to where great solutions emerge from islands that have applicability up and down our coast throughout the state and, and really beyond. We focus our climate work in areas where we feel like we are best positioned for impact. There's lots of different ways to try to address this issue. We are focused on trying to support island communities on the front lines of climate change. The marine economy and the way that we all make a living, uh, so many of us make a living uh, in, in the marine economy and the intense change being felt there. Uh, leveraging our connections with municipal leaders and talking about infrastructure, again, Sometimes these discussions and processes around big capital investments can transfer from one technology or sector to another and supporting municipal leaders to understand the pros and cons and process for that is, is part of that. We're also intimately aware of and tracking the ways in which our ocean uh, environment is being impacted and the potential solutions that the ocean can provide in addressing climate change through uh, things like uh, ocean acidification, remediation, um, and carbon sequestration. So climate is uh, definitely at the forefront for our work as our, um, our coastal economies. And so realizing that um, we are really trying to, again, bring resources to the table for some of our coastal uh, communities and island communities, most important businesses. We are trying to provide technical assistance, business planning support that helps business owners see around the corner at where they could anticipate disruption on the social, economic, and climate realms to be more prepared for what the future can bring them. Part of that is leveraging um, our Tom Glenn Community Impact Fund, which is allowing us to make grants and loans to businesses and even municipalities to invest in some infrastructure projects. And trying to link all of this on the ground work to our statewide and federal policy advocacy efforts to make sure that we're able to leverage resources that are most helpful to businesses here on the coast. Again, um, we're really looking to focus this work where we feel like we have strengths and connections as it is, the blue economy, diversifying income streams there is a key piece of this, um, looking at the creative economy, the clean energy economy, and the digital economy for opportunities for us to prepare the workforce and businesses to deal with those changes that we know are waiting around the corner or maybe we're already grappling with. 
Um, finally, our social resilience work is really focused um, on people. I think um, I've been at the Island Institute for almost 13 years and have a background in clean energy work. And I think the thing that always differentiates the Island Institute in the room when you're talking about a particular technology or sector is that we come at this with people first. We start and we end with people. Um, and when we look to start with problem solving, we look at the people who are in the positions of needing to grapple with this change before we think about a technical or a financial solution even. Um, we are really making a lot of investments to formalize the ways in which we support local leaders. Um, you might be interested to check out our new leadership model on our website is helping to focus um, our work that we are trying to bring out to communities like Islesboro. I know there are a lot of folks um, on the line tonight who might not necessarily label themselves as leaders, but we absolutely would. We recognize sort of the formal and informal components of leadership. Sometimes you're elected, sometimes you're not, but if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and help um, make change for a brighter future for your community, that's who we wanna work with and support. And so um, this is not only around giving tools and resources to leaders to do what they need to do with in communities. It's about how we can support all of you as individuals that have your own needs and help you to thrive and grow. Um, as people wear so many different hats and try to grapple with so much change, we really want to make sure that um, leaders as individuals are feeling supported and able to develop and grow as leaders themselves. Um, another quick shout out to a great uh, initiative on Islesboro. The Island Fellows Program is a part of this strategy for us. It's been around for more than 20 years and it's been great to get to know Ann McKee a little bit and her work with the community center and the school. Um, I think the Fellows Program is a really integral strategy for us to support leaders um, at, at the local level by providing an extra set of hands. So um, with that, I'll just say, um, again, we've had a lot of pleasure working with folks on Islesboro and not just trying to help get the job done with what um, you're all trying to grapple with and solve for, but to try to tell the stories of what you're all doing as well. And so one thing I'll just point out is that we are actively trying to capture um, case studies from things on Islesboro through our solutions library. If you go to the islandinstitute.org slash solutions, you'll find all sorts of stories and case studies about the great work that many of you have done. Um, and I share those links on a daily basis with other communities here in Maine and throughout the US and even beyond. So I wanna say thank you to all of you for what you have done to help us learn and to ask us tough questions to grapple with because it almost surely has um, relevance to, to other places in our work and along our coast. So with that, I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense as to where we're at as an organization these days. Um, tonight, we're gonna hear from three staff, um, our new president, Tony Chatwin, uh, our senior community development officer, Kendra, Kendra Jo Grindle, and our Chief Policy Officer Nick Batista are here. Um, I wanna give each of them a chance to briefly introduce themselves before I start peppering them with questions that we've gathered from you all and then open it up to, to more live questions. So Tony, could you just uh, introduce yourself and say hello, please? Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, yes, I can. Hello, Al Alsboro. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking time to uh, meet with us today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and delighted to be in this uh, relatively still new job. Um, five months, I think, but nobody's counting. Um, and I think the, the sign, I've been learning a ton over the, the past five months um, and will continue to do so. Uh, personally, I'm an oceanographer by training. I have a PhD in oceanography, worked in fisheries my entire, uh, and fishing communities my entire uh, career. And I think that's prepared me well for uh, this job. Uh, coastal communities here and the fishing industry are very intertwined. And, um, and I'm very passionate about um, the ocean and the communities that uh, depend on them. Um, worked in nonprofits my entire career. And uh, my last job, uh, I was 13 years with a grant making organization called National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And my role there was to uh, make it, uh, help transform the organization from a, a grant maker to an outcome focused grant maker. So um, you'll hear from staff that I, I this is like a, uh, keep, keep 
um, like a broken record, I keep talking about what's the impact that we want to have and how are we going to scale the impact? And that's that's why one, one of the key reasons I got the job was um, because of this experience of, of looking at the resources that the organization has uh, and helping them sort of generate a collective impact that uh, is large scale and measurable. And so that's, that's what I, I'm uh, bringing in addition to just loving being here in the mid coast of Maine and uh, getting out and seeing all the islands. Three so far, but I'll talk, talk more about that later. And he says that after our sub-zero uh, temperatures earlier this week, I think it's a, a good sign. <laughs> Kendra Joe, would you mind saying hello? Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Kendra Joe Grindle. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I have been working at the Island Institute um, for about three years now. I'm a senior community development officer, as Suzanne mentioned. I am the strategic lead for our broadband work and our sea level rise initiatives. Um, fortunately, tonight I get to wear the sea level rise hat because your broadband's not terrible. Um, I don't have to like actively put the call back in because you get dropped off the call number in like I do with most communities. So it's exciting to talk a little bit about the other 50% of my job. Um, I was an island fellow through the Island Institute um, from 2013 to 2015 on Islesboro. So I've gotten to know the community pretty well. I lived up on Keller Point Road um, in the middle of the island there and just really loved the community. And um, I'm excited to be back at the Island Institute in this capacity and being able to go out and um, be involved in a bit more of the work than I uh, was as a fellow. So thank you all for having me. Thanks, Kendra Joe. Um, I have to say, Kendra Joe, like a, a number of our staff have deep connections to the communities that we work with. A um, number of our staff live on unbridged islands or previously lived and, and have connections. I used to actually um, live briefly out on Manhegan Island. And so I think it's really um, one of the nice things we've been able to do is to support staff to, to folks to join our staff from the island communities. And I think they're a tremendous resource for us as a staff and um, really help to keep us informed with our ears to the ground. So great to have you Kendra Joe, with us tonight. I wanna round out our staff introductions with Nick Batista. Hello everybody, um, I'm the chief policy officer at the Island Institute. Um, and in that role, I do a lot of policy work and then also um, help look at and provide leadership for our monitoring data um, and evaluation capacities. Um, in, I also work on the broadband team for Kendra Joe and um, Islesboro was the last island I went to. I was out there with Tony and Kendra Joe for a, a quick minute, set, set foot on the island and then had to turn around and go home because my daughter's daycare closed because of COVID. And so I got to miss the fun day, but it was, Good to at least ride the ferry and get out to Islesboro. Um, I've been at the Island Institute for 10 years and um, worked on marine issues and policy issues and a, a bunch of other things. And so excited for the conversation and good to see a, a number of familiar faces out there. It, these are the times. Uh, I'm, I'm just grateful that you could all spend the time um, joining us tonight. So um, if we can't quite stay on island for very long in, in these times. So I wanna uh, move over to some questions. We did ask folks again in the, in the emails in advance um, to send some uh, questions into us ahead of time. And um, I just, I'll start off with those. So Tony, this is really directed at you in terms of, um, can you share with us something that you've learned or maybe that has surprised you in the, your first few months at the Island Institute? Yeah, so, I mean, like I mentioned before, um, I've been learning a lot every day, all the time. Um, I I would say less less than a surprise. More, I've been very impressed by the entrepreneurial spirit that I find in uh, the island and coastal communities uh, here in Maine. Everywhere you look, everybody's trying something new, trying to improve on what they have, and uh, adapt to a new situation. And I find that really exciting and energizing. Um, I. I guess I was surprised by uh, enjoying the sub-zero temperatures for 10 minutes. That's all I can make out, do outside, but uh, that was fun. 
Um, and I, I am just, um, uh, and, and I've been impressed uh, with our fellows program. And I think that uh, it wasn't a surprise, but uh, seeing how the fellows uh, and the community interact, the community welcomes the fellows and the fellows help the community as the community needs. It's, uh, it's a fantastic program that I, and I haven't come across a program like that in all the other nonprofits where I worked. It's, it's, really, um, it's really exciting and, and meaningful. So I'd say those are some, but again, I'm learning every day. Uh, I, I guess I'll share too, um, because the community, uh, I've lived in, in, in much bigger communities um, where I think you lose that sense of community and uh, coming into, I think it's true for New England, but Maine in particular and here in the mid coast. Uh, one of the things that I was surprised by and very pleasantly surprised by is that um, the, uh, what is it? The honor rule uh, still is in effect here. Um, like honor, honor system, like uh, people believe you, you take you at your word. And uh, I think that's really refreshing. And, uh, and I love it actually, um, because we should, we should uh, be taken at our word. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, yes, keys and cars and uh, notebooks in stores and that kind of stuff. Yeah, very cool. Thank you, Tony, for offering those reflections. Um, I know just a few more people who have even joined us in the last few minutes. So um, whatever way you would like to ask your question in the chat box, you can direct message me. I just got one. I'll add to our list. Sue Bernier is behind the scenes helping us. You can send her message. We would love to hear your voices. So if anybody's actually comfortable to ask their question and come off of mute when I call them, we, we'd, we'd love for you to do that. I know Zoom is a little, little tricky like that. But um, yeah, keep teeing up your questions. And I'm going to go through a couple of other ones we got through email. But um, thank you, Tony. Nick. So uh, a couple of questions and comments, both through the um, visit last week and an email circle around a really important set of issues that the Island Institute, in part, uh, you and I have been working closely on this, are trying to develop a long-term strategy that addresses all of the disruption we're seeing in what we call internally critical transportation. So in many ways, that's uh, ferry operators, the ferry service, the private ferries that serve the islands, and in some cases, um, we think about air service as part of that critical service as well. So um, Nick, yeah, can you share an update on where we're at? What we, what's going on? What's the latest in this multi-chapter series that is um, securing year-round affordable service to the islands? Yeah. So as as you all on the on the call know, a affordable, reliable ferry plays a pretty key role in the future of your community. Um, and you know, when I when I think about the role that Islesboro has played in our our development and understanding of the importance of the ferry as an organization, I think back to how you showed up as a community um, when, it, when we were going through the fare increase a couple of years ago. Um, I think about how your ferry service advisory board members ask tough questions to the main state ferry service when they're keeping an eye on the finances or making sure that the ferry service is honoring the, the commitments that they've made. Um, in ferry conversations, I, I think it's safe to say that Islesboro has helped teach us at the Island Institute a lot about the role that the ferry plays in the community and how connected it is to the future of the community and how connected the ferry service is to the rest of the work that you're, that you're doing. Um, at the Island Institute, our, our new strategic framework, we have staff who are now able to dedicate time to working on ferry issues through that critical um, service team that Suzanne was mentioning. We're working with community partners, um, the Maine State Ferry Service Advisory Board members, the Ferry Service, the DOT Commissioner's Office, and a nationally recognized consultant to review the existing ferry systems, um, look at some opportunities, and then do a community-based needs assessment that will help inform the future of the Maine State Ferry Service. Um, this is pretty exciting work. Um, you know, from the questions the, the consultant has, consultants have been asking um, as we're refining the scope, the, they clearly understand the connection between the ferry, the operations, the schedule, the infrastructure, the costs, and the long-term future of the ferry service. 
And they understand that without people who live and work in island communities, the ferry service is, uh, doesn't have as good a reason to be. And so that's really important. They get it, they're helping Maine DOT get it, um, which is pretty exciting. And you know, hopefully they will continue to do that. There's more to come on this in the next few weeks. Um, we haven't finalized the scope of work yet, but we're pretty close. Um, the community survey that many of you filled out last fall um, has also been helping to inform these efforts and the consultant will get it and that will form, um, help inform their early thinking on how to undertake this project. So um, more to come very soon. Don't hesitate to reach out to myself or to um, Lisa on our staff and we'll share a, a blog post as a, a link to a blog post in the follow-up email that talks a little bit more about some of this. Super. I am actually going to pause because I would be surprised if there was not a follow-up question for you on that, Nick. So um, I would invite anybody who's like, wait, but what about this? Uh, something in the chat box or even just come off of mute. Um, I know, Nick, you've been having conversations with folks on Islesboro about this process. So I don't know if anybody wants to just share their perspective of how um, they've been thought partners to us on this work. Any, any brave one souls to come off of mute? Yes, this is Lauren Bruce. Uh, could you repeat how these cons who the consultants are uh, that, that you're talking about working with in this regard? Um, I, 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 I'm getting some of that information, but I missed a piece of it. Yeah, so the, the consulting firm that um, we're looking at is called KPFF. They recently did a study for um, Casco Bay Lines, and they've done a number of studies on West Coast ferry systems. They're a nationally recognized ferry service. Um, importantly, um, Mark Higgins, the ferry service manager, and the folks in the in the commissioner's office um, listen to them and appreciate them and appreciate having having them ask questions. Um, we're still finalizing the the scope of work with them, but um, it's pretty pretty exciting. They do this a lot, and they're um, I think they're excited to get to work. And what they've been telling us is that they don't often uh, see see a ferry service that is you know has a, an informed constituency who wants to engage in the process and has an outside group who can help support the consulting in the communities and has a ferry service that is willing to share information, willing to um, share their data, willing to just you know, hand over everything that they need to, to do, a, do the study. Um, and then the other thing that's pretty exciting about this work is um, they've done a bunch of electric ferry design work and support work for other ferry services and they're pretty good at that. And so um, they keep talking about that and DOT is starting to listen to that as well. Thanks Lauren for jumping in. I hope that helps. Um, John I, John King, I saw um, came on video and I know he's been a part of the discussion. Do you wanna jump in on this John and offer any of your perspectives? Uh, sure, just very briefly. Um, uh, I basically like to thank you folks for becoming involved in the ferry service situation and the issues that arise with the ferry service because uh, it is kind of without precedent and I think it will be helpful. Um, I've had a lot of discussions with uh, just for the folks who are on who uh, don't know. Um, uh, I, I am the, the uh, Ellsboro uh, Advisory Board representative, and I'm also the guy that was behind uh, with Lauren Bruce's help, some of the select folks help uh, putting that ferry survey together um, so we could hopefully accelerate the uh, replacement schedule for the Margaret Chase Smith. And uh, our understanding right now is that um, the plan that the ferry service has is to uh, have a replacement vessel that's electric and that is double-ended. So it won't have to turn around. Um, all of which is great, but it's going to be a long slog. Uh, we've got infrastructure issues and cost issues. But the idea behind the survey 
was to try to accelerate things because right now the uh, it, under the capital plan with the Maine State Ferry Service, the replacement of the Margaret Chase Smith is scheduled for 2028, which uh, uh, is not a great thing given the infrastructure legislation that has just been passed in Washington. We'd like to try to get some of that money. Um, um, but in any event, uh, that's just to bring people up to speed. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, my one comment would be is once the scope of this uh, project is uh, defined, I, I hope you would share it with us. Uh, because my hope is that in addition to giving uh, the Maine State Ferry Service DOT some, uh, you know, savvy, uh, responsible advice, that they might take a whole look and Nick and I have had this discussion, but I'll just reiterate it. Take a whole look at what's going on in Penobscot Bay right now. And is what we have, which is really just because it's grown out of what started in the 1920s with one boat that could carry one car, uh, uh, the best way to go right now? Or should we look at newer models uh, and, and um, uh, models that don't just go from, say, Lincolnville to Grindle Point and Rockland to Carver's Harbor, uh, but maybe have a high-speed passenger boat that goes rocketing around Penobscot Bay. And I don't know if we can afford that or not, but it's, a, it's at least something that should be considered. So that's the kind of thing I would like to see come out of this project, but I do applaud uh, the Island Institute for... Uh, taking the laboring ore on this very, very important issue. It's uh, nice to have some company. Well, I would just say it's it's nice to have your thought partnership on all of this stuff and for all the conversations we've had over the years to, to get us to the point where we can be having this conversation now. It's very helpful. And you know, the this next part of the study, we've broken it into two phases. The second phase, once we have the community needs assessment, um, that's really starting to look at what are a couple of scenarios and delving deeply into the to that data and, and looking at you know that question that you're that you're asking john is right right in there good okay thanks thank you john yeah thanks for your help on this i have to say um it's helpful for us to have this orientation of looking to the future because it really does force us to sharpen our pencil, go back to those assumptions, you know, exactly what you're saying, what's going on in Penn Bay. And it's not just the ferry service. Um, we've been talking internally about the two things we get the most calls on these days right now, I would say three. And it'll uh, a prelude to a future question is, um, the, is that we're getting questions about issues around working waterfront access and preservation. We're getting uh, calls about affordable housing and workforce housing. And I would say the number three thing that we're getting calls about every week almost is a ferry operator that is having a major challenge. Um, and it's not just the ferry service. And so communities like Manhegan, should they be coming out of Rockland instead of Port Clyde? I mean, there's literally big, big questions about the future on the table for a really critical element for our island economy. So yeah, thank you all for your work on this and um, please be in touch um, with any of us if you wanna uh, continue the discussion on this front. Um, Kendra Joe, I wanna go to you. Speaking of future or maybe today and right now, um, you are working on sea level rise and I know you're on the island a lot and spend a lot of time talking to people. I think you were out walking around, checking out different sites and locations. And I think, you know, I've heard that a lot of the questions you get around you know, what are the impacts that you're likely to see on Islesboro from a sea level rise perspective? And what are the pathways forward for a community to address um, the situation? Sure. Thanks, Suzanne. I, I don't know how I follow up ferries, but I will um, because they are connected in a lot of ways. And so sea level rise is a prevalent issue all along our coast, but definitely seen, you know, some of the most in immediate impact to infrastructure and to just the way a community has always worked on islands. Islesboro is one, Final Haven's another. Um, and so, yeah, I think actually most people that I've talked to in just the past couple of weeks on some of these issues on the community are on this call, Shay Conover, Dave Petzl, Craig Olson. Um, I think some of the issues are complex and we don't always think of them as being sea level rise, but just climate adaptation um, as, a, as a larger scope 
um, we kind of know about you know, the narrows, the flooding at the narrows that occurs, the, the rock walls that have been built up to try to protect that really small piece of land. Um, it's really just the width of the road and a little bit more. Um, you've got Grindle Point, which if that is inundated, that's your transportation on and off the island. Um, and, you know, talking a little bit more with, with Dave and I saw recently in the Islesboro um, Island News, you know, the piece on the lighthouse as well, um, do you restore? Do you restore when sea level rise is coming? How do you go about that? And so seeing and hearing from community members, you know, what the priorities are, as well as how they're thinking really creatively and innovatively um, about what those solutions could be for some of those pieces. Um, looking not just at what's already happening in Maine, we have this conversation internally a lot of, you know, for Maine, there's still a lot of learning we can do from elsewhere because we don't know the scope of solutions or the creative thinking that could go behind um, the solution that fits the community and the situation that we're looking at. So um, it's been really great to hear how some community members are talking, not just across the coast of Maine, but to um, engineers and communities you know, much further down the East Coast or even somewhere else along the coast in the country to try to bring some of that thinking here and implement it um, where we're seeing, you know, we will, um, the climate council moved forward on sea level rise inundation, those levels being you know, a foot and a half by 2050. So um, projecting to manage that and then four feet by uh, 2100. With those numbers finally written into law, it changes the way we look at those solutions. Um, I was. I've, like we've mentioned, I was just out bringing Tony around and talking with Shay a little bit. And we just, I briefly mentioned Mill Creek. That was a, a project that happened while I was a fellow, the Mill Creek Bridge. If that was done now with the um, laws in place that um, Governor Mills and the Climate Council just put in place, that bridge would look a little bit different because it would be able to handle and prepare for those sea level rise numbers. Um, and it's, it's great to see that DOT is starting to pull those numbers in um, to their future projects. But 2013, 2014, when that was built, wasn't that long ago. Um, and that's a piece of infrastructure that you know, could potentially have looked a little bit different if you took sea level rise into the perspective. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's really incredible how Islesboro as a community is able to look at the broad scope of issues um, I'm excited to see how more of those kind of independent projects can be connected and the community can be brought into some of those conversations and start to prioritize, not just based on the immediate needs, but what are those long-term solutions that'll really get the community looking, not just the five years out, but five, 10, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. or even further than that. Um, you already did it with broadband, with generational infrastructure. How do you look at other infrastructure projects in the same way? Not just that short-term fix, but that generational solution. Um, so I'm pretty excited to see how some of those conversations move forward in the community and some visioning work around what sea level rise is able to, and climate adaptation in general um, can be. And I think, you know, I know Shay's revived the sea level rise committee. They're looking across um, at lots of options and there's been some research done already that can be improved, so. It's exciting time. Thanks, Kendra Joe. Any quick responses to uh, reactions or questions for Kendra Joe? Shay, I don't know if we might lure you off of mute if you want to add any additional perspective on what's going on on Islesboro on this. Um, no, I mean, I think Kendra Joe did a, a great job and it was. Um, Oh, sorry. It was really helpful to see um, her on island earlier this week. I mean, I, the sea level rise is committee is um, right now just preparing um, to focus on a variety of different areas, the narrows, the, the Grindle Point. I know that Craig Olson is doing a great job in considering sea level rise as a uh, he does work on the Dark Harbor Wastewater Treatment Facility. Um, and I, I think that the guidance from the state is incredibly helpful as we go through that planning process, because uh, when we first started 
talking about how to address sea level rise, a lot of the conversation was pretty circular about what is our appetite for risk and what should we be planning for. And um, to have the state's uh, climate council provide some pretty clear guidance about what the minimum we should plan for. And I think really on Islesboro, we are trying to take a, that longer range look and make sure that we're planning for some of the more aggressive scenarios to make sure that we are um, we're preparing for the long term as um, as you said. So thank you for your support and it's really helpful to know that you are a phone call away as we tackle you know this really really large issue. Thanks Shay for chiming in there. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, two things. It's it's great to hear you know more about the work that's going on there. We're uh, trying to support groups up and down the coast on this front. Vinyl Haven, uh, just across the bay, has been doing a lot of great work, and we were really fortunate to be able to help tell their story through a film that we released last year um, as part of our Climate of Change series. And uh, I think it's only about ten or eleven minutes long. If you've got the time, you might be interested to check out. Um, their work on this particular topic. And I have to say, uh, yeah, with Islesboro's track record with grappling with big infrastructure projects and Kendra Joe's um, experience of guiding communities to think about that generational infrastructure, um, I think there's probably a lot of interesting work to, to come on this front. So thanks. I'm gonna go back to Tony. Um, this is something I alluded to a little bit earlier, which was that when I chatted with Tony and, and Chuck and Jay and Kendra Doe after their trip out last week, um, I suppose it wasn't a surprise, but an important indicator for us as we try to listen to communities that housing issues, particularly workforce housing issues were the number one topic of conversation when you were out there. And so, Tony, I know you've only been here for a few months and housing may not be the sort of background that you're most familiar with, but I know you've been thinking about it a lot. Um, could you share some of your reflections on the housing crisis that is facing the islands and the coast, um, as well as some insights as to what the Island Institute is trying to do to tackle these issues? Yeah, that is a big question, uh, <laughs> but I'll give it give it a try. I, I really like the term of generational solution, um, and uh, I'll get I'll get to the answer eventually, but uh, or a kind of answer, but. Um, when I when I'm listening here to to each of you, uh, the the staff members um, uh, of the Island Institute talk about these uh, issues that we're tra tackling together with you, Osborne, and with other community communities, they are really uh, big issues, big complex issues that uh, are persistent. And um, I'm just thinking that we we in order to the solutions for them have to be sort of commensurate um, on. On housing, uh, I have, as I'm doing with all these other issues, I've I've been learning that it's this is this is a persistent issue, and uh, it's and it comes in in cycles. But the the upside of being a persistent issue is that there are solutions that have been tried and uh, effectively put in place uh, in times past. So I, I like history, um, and history I think can be quite uh, helpful. Um, and so I understand that the state had a program that uh, provided funds for uh, communities that had solutions um, that they had come up with to tackle this uh, issue of affordable housing. Um, and um, well, Nick, it was like yesterday, uh, I got to meet uh, Lisa Fleming Ives from the uh, Genesis Fund, who was involved with the previous round of funding that the um, the state had. And, and she was very optimistic that uh, there may be some more money coming uh, from the state to implement solutions to uh, address affordable housing. And um, so when I look to the future, I think that is, uh, that's a hopeful sign. Um, the, also how I'm, and this might not be that I have a ready-made solution or that we have a ready-made solution for housing, but, one thing that I have experience with in my uh, professional life uh, is um, developing public-private partnerships. And that's a great way to harness the collective impact of many different interests. Um, and I think that's the only way that we can, can really uh, get these large and lasting solutions in place. So that I, th I think, I, 
if you were, the way it was set up is like, and the answer is, uh, the answer is communities, you come up with a solution and we will be there to help you um, uh, find the right funding to put it in place. I think that I would say that would be the solution. And we're gonna do that with all of these uh, different things. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Suzanne. Tony. Yeah, no, what, what a huge issue. Um, Nick, is there anything you wanna add? I know you've been having a lot of conversations um, with island groups, with coastal groups, with the state, anything you wanna add on this front? Yeah, just uh, two things to follow up on, on what Tony said. Um, internally at the Island Institute, we are taking a close look at housing and how it fits in with the rest of our work and where where and how and, and where what do we do? Um, and particularly, how do we work with partners like Genesis Fund? And then just um, keep an eye on that that program that funded the Islesboro project a number of years ago, that island specific housing housing program. Um, that's that would that's good to just keep in your minds as we move forward for the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Nick. Um, Rick, I, I see Rick Rogers on the line and um, know from our case study work on Islesboro is featured in the Solutions Library for the affordable housing work. Rick, is there anything you want to add as, as follow up from the work you're doing or anybody else on the line who wants to jump in on this topic? Sure. Uh, Liza is a great resource. So she wrote the uh, program back in 2011 or 12 or whenever that was. And uh, Islesboro, along with a number of other islands, were able to create. Uh, Largely, it was two two units was the minimum that was required to access uh, those accounts, and so a number of islands uh, over a period of about two years were able to uh, add to their either add to their inventory or in some cases at some islands start their own housing projects, and uh, like Tony said, and I think maybe Nick chimed in, Liza and uh, Mark Primo there at Genesis are pretty pretty gung-ho about the probability that, that, that the funds will be replenished in there. And uh, my conversations with them said that there were six islands that uh, were looking to access that money. And the request that was made was for 200,000 per unit of 500,000 total grant, which would uh, significantly uh, improve the probability that affordable housing could be built on the islands. Although this day and age, it's current uh, prices of everything. That's going to be, you know, it, it compounds the problem. I have a question for Nick because he's the policy guy. Have you heard anything more from Ryan Fecto and the uh, zoning changes? Have we, is there any more on that front? Because one of the problems we all have is that there's only so much property, and especially with the recent uh, what is the phrase everybody uses? Amenity migrants that have come to all the islands and bought up a lot of the property. It's getting harder and harder to find affordable property to develop into affordable housing. I was wondering if he's heard anything about that. Yeah, so the state legislature um, had a six month study commission this fall that looked at zoning and land use and the connection between those and affordable housing. And that study really dove into the role of the, the state as a whole and the role of local municipalities in zoning and that, and that relationship, particularly on an issue like affordable housing or workforce housing. Um, they released a report in the last couple of weeks and have, presenting it to the um, legislative committee, the labor and housing committee next week. A um, couple of the recommendations in that report are um, you know, things like supporting municipalities that want to look at their zoning um, and look at, and I think there's a whole bunch of changes that they're um, suggesting that you could look at. Um, there are a couple of other recommendations in that report too, things like getting rid of single family zoning um, outside of shoreline protection zones or other, other zones. Um, or uh, allowing people to add accessory dwelling units as a right. Um, Things, things like that, that the state is, um, they were big policy conversations for the committee um, and there was general agreement that they were good ideas for the legislature to move forward. So I think there will be 
um, some conversations this winter at the legislature and um, there is a strong recognition that anytime the state is recommending or, or making changes to um, the state zoning overlay and, and the authority of municipalities to um, do do their zoning, they also need to provide a corresponding set of assistance to help communities look at their zoning and incentives to work towards improving zoning. Um, and so, you know, I don't I don't have a sense of where this conversation goes, other than um, it's one of the big conversations at the legislature this this year. Um, and we'll put the we'll put the link to the report in the um, in the email out too. Thanks, Nick. Yep, I just saw the request for that. Thanks, Kayla, for chiming in on on that. And Rick, thanks thanks for all your work on this front. Um, you know, in some ways, the islands have a heads up on. Um, you know, not a heads up, but a leg up in some of this work. Unfortunately, the challenges have been so significant for so long, but in some ways, I think um, it's not like the challenge is any less moving forward, but there's a lot we can learn. Um, interestingly enough, my first sort of community development island focused work was an internship I did with MISCA on Monhegan Island, their affordable housing group while I was in graduate school before I had this job. So um, housing is on islands has been sort of part of my starting point for, for this work. So thanks for all of that. Um, we probably have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, if you haven't submitted anything in the chat box to Sue or myself or to the general public, <laughs> uh, please do so. I did receive a question earlier about the news coming out of uh, from the state uh, from Searsport and um, the review that is going to be going on with Sears Island and the offshore wind uh, facility there and what the Island Institute's role is in all of that. Um, I thought I would take a stab at that since it's actually a piece of work that I've had some degree of involvement in. Um, for those of you who are following this topic, um, the state of Maine has kicked off a long-term planning process for the development of offshore wind uh, that they're calling their roadmap process. They, they have a website online as well, but the offshore wind roadmap is coming out of the governor's energy office. And um, there's a whole host of folks from across the state who have been brought together to try to look at lots of different elements about the future of offshore wind. Um, everything from the workforce development opportunity and the sort of jobs training component to energy markets and understanding sort of how we get this power to market if in, uh, as it's developed. And a major focus also uh, around the fisheries intersection and the opportunity to sort of support coexistence and sort of find ways to make offshore wind less disruptive. Um, I think it's important to say that we as an organization uh, realize that climate change is one of the biggest threats that we face and the need for clean energy is very much there. Um, I think we also realize that you know offshore wind has the potential to be disruptive to, to other uses that are there and it, a lot for us all to adapt to. And so I think we're really seeking to use our experience of supporting leaders to deal with change in tough situations to try to reduce this disruption. And so um, we've been involved in the offshore wind space in supporting communities to engage in state and federal processes and particularly with developers. Um, I spoke of my connections to Monhegan and we've been working very closely with Monhegan for more than 10 years now to try to understand what the development of offshore wind means for them right off of their shores, um, supporting good communications as best we can communications uh, with the developer, helping the community to develop a community benefits agreement. Um, and, you know, at various points in time, trying to understand how we can support folks in the fishery side of things to better understand what this means for them. And also to help renewable energy developers in the state and regulators better understand the impacts that this potentially could bring. And so I see our role is just trying to help make sure that we can understand these situations a little bit more holistically and be a little bit more creative in our problem solving around it. And coming together with good stakeholder process is, has got to be a part of that. And so as part of the offshore wind roadmap process, I sit on the advisory committee that oversees the work of those three working groups, including a, as well as a fourth working group that's focused on the ports work. And so um, while we are not the body that is reviewing the state's analysis that is moving forward, we are the body that is helping to set the standards of what this process will look like moving forward. And I think it's safe to say 
that across all these areas of work, we are looking to really bring greater focus to what communication with stakeholders looks like, to what um, answering questions you know, looks like, and how we can get good and meaningful information on the table. And so that's a process that will run through 2022. Um, we are reviewing some very draft pre preliminary recommendations for the state to consider in terms of this process right now. And so I would welcome anybody that is is following the offshore wind space and um, feels like we could put a finer point on what community engagement and some of this decision making looks like, um, or just in terms of informing uh, and understanding the issues more comprehensively, um, feel free to reach out and um, let me know how, you know, we can make sure that you know, we can develop this renewable energy resource in a way that tries to minimize that disruption. So Tony, Nick, you guys are tracking this as well. I don't know if there's anything that else that you want to add to that. No, I, I think uh, there's not much to add to what you just said. <laughs> That's where we're at. There's still a lot to learn. Obviously, the state has a lot to study, and I think we'll be following along for sure. So um, with that, I just uh, want to start to move to wrap up. If um, folks have final questions or whatnot, certainly you can, can be in touch. I want to ask you an exit question. This is something that we do. It's sort of like a terrible torture device of like, I want to get out of a meeting. I would like you to think about, as you prepare to jump off tonight, to go into the chat box. I want to know what really resonated with you tonight. Um, where, are, where do you see as the most compelling opportunity for the Island Institute to support the challenges that Islesboro is facing or the opportunities that you see? Where would you like to see us try to work together in the, in the months and years ahead? If you wouldn't mind leaving your thought in the chat box before you leave, that would be wonderful. Um, and yeah, just a, a couple of reminders that um, we will be sending a follow-up email to anybody who pre-registered. Thank you for doing that. We'll get you some links to some great resources to check out. You are absolutely welcome to be in touch with any of us. Um, and our contact info is all on the website, um, or you can just get in touch with Sue Bernier, who was our uh, chief event coordinator tonight, and she can get you contact information. And just thank you. Thank you for being with us in this funny way of staying connected. Um, thanks for showing up tonight and for every day and what you do to make the coast of Maine such a special place. Without your support, um, without your input, we wouldn't be able to confront the challenges that, that we know are ahead. So thank you all. Um, please stay, stay safe and stay Suzanne. healthy. Yeah, and enjoy the winter. Yeah. So and if I if I could just add, you know, I yeah. had the privilege of going out to Alsborough and, and getting to know your, your community and your island uh, over a beautiful day before the big freeze. And um, and now I, I feel privileged to have seen more of the community members, you know, because of these COVID times, we weren't able to do what we would like to do, which is to have this gathering in, in person. But uh, I look forward to, to learning more and, and coming out and, and meeting uh, you all personally, hopefully soon. So thank you. Absolutely. And if you're stuck on the mainland, you can usually find Tony in this office most days. So thank you again, everybody stay safe and stay healthy and um, stay in touch, please. Thank you again for all your support and for all that you do.